let's uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much this day, Lord, the opportunity to be here and all that you've given us and the the chances that you give us as men to make a difference every day in the lives of the people around us. Lord, we just ask you to just to just to fill this this whole area right here with the Spirit, Lord, and just let what we're doing here radiate to the houses and the people around us, Lord. Let's let them sit in their living rooms and think, wow, there's, there's something going on right now. I'm not sure what it is, but it's the Holy Spirit moving through the people around us. Lord, let's, let us be the beacon of light right here in the middle of Dublin. We love you so much for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Even when I don't see it, you 
This next song talks about the history of always being the kind of person that God wants us to be. And he talks about, in, this, in this song, Josh Baldwin talks about the evidence of the goodness and, and the nature of Christ that's inside of us. And he's always talking about how, you know, when we walk around town here in Dublin as local men of Dublin and leaders of Dublin and entrepreneurs and whatever we are, and, and students, whatever, when we walk around Dublin and we, the people see us, do they see the evidence of Christ in our life? Do they see the evidence of goodness and grace and mercy and all the things that Christ died for? Do they see that in us? And that's what I challenge you with, is that whenever you leave here tonight to go out to the community and be a beacon of light for all those around you. Good morning, this is Kyle Gerard with A-Plus Flooring and Construction. I'm standing in a home that we recently renovated for a customer. A kitchen is a very vital part of a home, especially when you get ready to resell or just you like to entertain people. 
We came in with new granite countertops. We even changed some of the seating areas of it. We refinished all the cabinets, put new doors, new hardware. We can use your existing cabinets. One of the things that we did that changed the look of this kitchen was the lighting that we did. We added a lot of LED spotlights. Went from an old oak, gun stock, hardwood floor to a new hickory, random length floor. We can change it from top to bottom. Lots of many pretty things that we've done. Come by and see us at A-plus Flooring and Construction at 1801 Rice Avenue in Dublin, Georgia. Or give us a call at 478-676-2662. Hope to see you soon. Here at Stepping Stone, you are never alone. If you or someone you know has been a victim of child abuse, please call our fully confidential crisis number at 478-595-8339.
First Lawrence Bank invites you to experience banking at its best. Whether you have personal or business needs, we're a full service bank big enough to handle all of your banking needs and small enough to provide you with that personal touch you've grown to expect from a community bank like First Lawrence Bank. Looking forward to your future, that's First Lawrence Bank in Dublin and Dexter, member FDIC. You've got miles and miles of grass to mow. So you're going to need a machine built to perform day in and day out, season after season. You're going to need a Gravely built to mow the distance. Find your new Gravely mower at Myers Equipment and Supply, 301 North Jefferson in Dublin. I was at the University of Georgia from 1991 to 1999, and my friends uh, like to tell me now that all of the students who are currently at Georgia were not born when I was there. <laughs> so that's it's always encouraging to hear. Um, it's good to be here. I've, I've known Charles for a long time. I've known his father as well for, for a good bit of years. Uh, Lisa, uh, Charles's little sister, was at Georgia when I was there. I uh, had the privilege of knowing her and actually uh, uh, officiating her wedding. And uh, Also, Charles lived with my brother for some years in Macon, but we probably shouldn't talk until, start, start telling stories about that. I grew up in uh, the northwest corner of Alabama, a little town, a little group of towns, the Quad Cities, uh, Tuscany, Sheffield, Muscle Shoals, and Florence. Muscle Shoals is pretty well known for the music industry. Um, Florence is the biggest of the four. Uh, Tuscany is uh, the birthplace of Helen Keller. And that's where I'm from and grew up. And then Sheffield, the fourth town, is where my wife is from, and that's the only good thing that ever came out of Sheffield. <laughs> and uh, growing up in Tuscambia, we had what we called a country club. It was the Tennessee Valley Country Club. What it really was was a nine-hole golf course with a small pool. And but to us, it was a country club. And I remember as a kid, my mom would take us on Saturday mornings. There were six of us. And I was number four. And she would take the first four on Saturday mornings uh, before the other two were born. And, uh, she'd take us to the pool, and we would swim and uh, you know get to see our friends and stuff. But as a young kid, I can remember standing in the shallow end of the pool. And if you if you've seen pools like this, there's a rope that grows across the middle of the pool, and the rope is there for a purpose of showing you this is the deep end. And this is the shallow end. And so, you know, shallow end separated from the deep end by a rope. And I can remember as a kid standing in the shallow end of the pool and looking out across the rope into the deep end of the pool and watching the big, big kids play. And it always looked like to me that the big kids were having more fun in the deep end than the little kids were having in the shallow end. And I figured out years later why that why it looked like that. Because they were. <laughs> they were having more fun. And the lesson that I've learned from that is that we were created for the deep end of the pool. None of us were created uh, to live in the shallow end. We weren't created to live uh, in mediocrity. Uh, we were created by God uh, to live by faith and to live in the deep end of the pool. I want to read you a quote uh, from a guy by the name of Mike Iaconelli. Ya Mike Iaconelli was a, a youth worker and a pastor in California for a number of, number of years. and He referred to his church as the slowest growing church in America. Uh, but he was, he was a great guy. He was also an author. Uh, he died tragically in a car crash in 2003. But Mike said this, uh, every day I want to be in the dangerous proximity to Jesus. I long for a life that explodes with meaning and is tilled with adventure, wonder, risk, and danger. I long for a faith that is gloriously treacherous, 
I want to be with Jesus, not knowing whether to cry or laugh. The critical issue today is dullness. We have lost our astonishment. The good news is no longer good news, it's okay news. Christianity is no longer life-changing, it's life-enhancing. Jesus doesn't change people into wild-eyed radicals anymore. He changes them into nice people. If Christianity is about being nice, I'm not interested. I'm ready for a Christianity that ruins my life, that captures my heart and makes me uncomfortable. I want to be dangerous to a dull and boring religion. The greatest enemy of Christianity may be people who say they believe in Jesus, but are, who are no longer astonished and amazed. We've forgotten how to dance, how to sing, and how to laugh. We've allowed technology to beat our imaginations into submission and have become tourists rather than travelers. We've been stunted by mediocrity. Our world is populated with domesticated grown-ups who would rather settle for safe, predictable answers instead of wild, unpredictable mystery. Faith has been reduced to a comfortable system of beliefs about God instead of an uncomfortable encounter with God. 2 Chronicles 16, 9 is my life verse. I've chased after to live by it for the last 40 years. It goes like this. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. I want to know what it looks like, feels like, smells like to be fully, fully committed fully surrendered to God. There was a little boy one time who was walking down the street and uh, he had in his pocket a sack full of marbles. Uh, he loved his marbles. He loved one marble in particular. It was his favorite. And as he looked down the street, he saw a little girl headed towards him and she was eating something. And as he got closer, he saw that she was eating chocolate malt balls, which just happened to be his favorite candy. When he got up to her, he said, I sure would love those malt balls. And she said, what do you got to trade? And he said, I got some marbles. She said, done. And as he reached in his pocket, he left his favorite marble in his pocket and pulled out all the others and he gave them to her. She gave him the chocolate. He turned and he started towards home. He ate the chocolate on the way home and he finished it before he got to the house. And then he reached in his pocket and he felt that one marble that he had saved. And he pulled it out and he rolled it in his fingers and he looked at it and this thought ran through his mind. I wonder, I wonder if she gave me all of the chocolate. The thing that we hold back, the thing that we keep from God, the thing that we refuse to surrender will always be the thing that causes us to stumble, causes us to doubt, and causes us to wonder if God has actually given all of himself to us. There was a man named Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was about 25, 26 years old, around 1902. And he longed for revival for his country. He lived in Wales. And uh, he began to pray. And his prayer was, God, bend me. He would pray every day for hours every morning. God, bend me. God, bend me. God, bend me. And what he meant by that was, God, bend me toward you and away from myself. Bend me toward your will and away from the world. Bend me shape me, break me, do whatever you have to do to use me, but please bring revival to Wales. One night, he was at his church, and they were having church in the main sanctuary, and he took a group of teenagers, just 10 or 12 teenagers, upstairs for a youth meeting. 
And there he shared with them. And as he began to talk with them and share with them the things that, that God had been putting in his heart and on his heart, the Spirit of God fell in that room and revival was born in the upstairs room of that church in a youth meeting. It spilled over from the youth meeting into the sanctuary downstairs and swept the whole church. And pretty soon it swept the whole town. And before you knew it, it had swept through that entire nation. In six months' time, 100,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. This revival was so pervasive that judges and jailers and policemen had to get new jobs because there was no crime. The bars all had to close because nobody was going to the bar. It was so, so much of an impact was had on the men of that town that the farmers said God had changed them so deeply that their language had changed and they stopped cursing and it was so dramatic, such a dramatic shift, such a dramatic change, that their horses didn't know how to obey them. They would try to plow a field, and when they said you know, to their horse, they gave a command, their horse didn't know what to do because the horse was used to them cursing, and now that they didn't curse, the horses couldn't follow. True story. Evan Roberts' message, to those young people was simple but it was also profound and, and it erupted into a revival that swept the whole country he gave them four simple things to do number one repent of all known sin repent of all known sin i was a college freshman now there were six kids in my family, and I, you can ask any of my brothers and sisters, they will tell you without hesitation, I was the black sheep of the family. Uh, I, I was the worst. I was in so much trouble all the time as a teenager. And uh, my, my mom, at one point, I was about 14, and my mom said to my dad, I'll take these five over here if you'll take that one. <laughs> and my dad said, what's wrong with Tom? And my mom said, I can't talk to him. I don't understand him. I don't get him. He worries me. And quite frankly, I'm really concerned about the friends that he's choosing. And my dad said, you know, Gene, his friend's parents are having that same conversation right now because they're worried that their children have chosen Tom. That was the life that I, I lived as a teenager. But as an 18-year-old freshman at the University of North Alabama, I was assigned a term paper that would change my life. University of North Alabama, secular state university. I walked into an honors English class, and I didn't belong in that class. I don't know how I got in there, except God just put me in that class. I was the dumbest person in the class. All of these people talked about their SAT scores and their ACT scores, and I just talked about the box scores in the newspaper, you know, from the baseball games. And that they, they were bragging about how smart they were, and I was just wondering how I wound up in that class. I walked into class one day, and everybody was passing papers to the front. And I turned to the girl sitting next to me, and I said, what are we doing? And she said, we're turning in our term paper topics. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, we have to do a term paper we're supposed to write three topics on a piece of paper, send it to the professor. She's going to choose from that group of three what we do our paper on. And I said, oh, well, can I borrow a piece of paper? She said, yes. I said, can I borrow a pen? She said, yes. And I said, can I see your topics? And she said, yes. And I didn't know at the time that she was a believer. And she showed me her three topics, and I didn't even read them, really. I just wrote them down and passed them in. And a few days later, I got back from my professor, circled in red ink, biblical prophecy. <laughs> Who does a term paper on biblical prophecy when you're not even a Christian? 
I was in a fraternity. My fraternity president had told me that they had term papers on everything, not to worry. As soon as I got my assignment, come to him, they pull it out of the filing cabinet. I went to him and I said, biblical prophecy. And he said, you've lost your mind. <laughs> There's never been a term paper done on biblical prophecy, ever. I went to the, key, to the library, the university library, to, to research this paper. Now, back then, you guys remember the card catalog. Some of these young guys, I don't even know what a card catalog is, but we used to have to look through these index cards in a card catalog to find books in the library. And I went in there looking for something on biblical prophecy. I found one book, a King James Bible. That was it. That was the only book in the entire library that had anything to do with biblical prophecy. I looked in the table of contents. There were minor prophets and major prophets. I figured it was like baseball. The minor prophets were not as good as the major prophets. And so I went to the major prophets and I started reading Daniel. And I'm sitting in a cubicle in that library reading the book of Daniel. And God spoke to me. Now, at the time, I just thought I had an idea. I didn't know what the, the voice of God sounded like. But as I was reading, this thought came to me. Get up, go get in your car, and drive to the church that you went to as a child that your parents still attend. They have a library in the basement, and they'll have books on biblical prophecy, and you can write this paper. I got up, I turned in the King James Bible, walked to my car, and I started driving towards Tuscumbia from Florence. As I was crossing the Tennessee River on O'Neill Bridge, I had a second thought, and God said to me, when you get to the church, don't go to the library. Go to the pastor's office and tell him everything you've ever done. I thought that was the worst idea I'd ever heard of. First idea sounded brilliant. Second idea sounded ridiculous. But by the time I got to the church, I decided that's what I would do. And I went in the church and I found the pastor and we went to his office and I told him everything I could think of that I'd ever done, every reason I could think of why God would not want me. And at the end of all of that, he said, do you believe at any point in your life you were a Christian? And I said, no. And he said, what do you think would happen if you died tonight? And I said, I'd go straight to hell. And he said, do you want to be a Christian? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And I gave my life to Jesus that night, and my life turned 180 degrees. He told me the last thing he said to me before I left the church that night was he said, before you go to bed tonight, tell somebody about the decision that you made here. It was about 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday night. I went home and I woke up my parents and I said, I've been a horrible son. I've made your life miserable, but tonight I gave my life to Jesus and from now on everything will be different. I went down the street to my grandparents' house and I woke them up and I said, I've been a horrible grandson. I've been a horrible example. But tonight I gave my life to Jesus and everything's going to be different from now on. Drove a couple blocks away, woke up my aunt and my uncle and my three cousins and I said, tonight I gave my life to Jesus and from now on my life will be different. And then I went back to my parents' house and I woke up my two younger brothers. One was 13, one was 11. And I said, I've been a horrible brother. I've made life miserable for both of you. And tonight I gave my life to Jesus and from now on things are going to be different. And then it just hit me, I hadn't said this with any of the others, but for some reason right there, I looked at my two younger brothers and I said, I was just curious, would either of you be interested in giving your lives to Jesus? My youngest brother, Bill, looked at me and said, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. And I prayed with Bill that night to give his life to Jesus and he's never, never turned back. He's been living for God ever since. My brother John was a little different. He was 13, he looked at me. He had been the brunt of my terrorism. And uh, he looked at me and said, you're crazy. He said, you've, you've treated me the way you've treated me. You've been horrible to me. He said, I, I actually hate you. And you've ruined my life. 
And you think you can walk in here and say, Jesus has changed everything and it's going to be fine. And he said, I'm going to watch you. This is not real. And it's not going to last. And I'm going to watch. And when you go back to being the same old sorry person you've always been, I'll be there. So I left. About eight weeks went by. There was a knock on my door. I opened my bedroom door late at night. John stood at my door. And he looked at me and he said, I've watched and I've waited. And the only explanation that I can give for the person that you are compared to the person that you were is that God must have done something. And so I just wanted to let you know that last night I knelt at my bed and I asked God to do for me whatever it was that he had done for you. My brother John is a pastor now in Huntsville, Alabama. Been living for God ever since that day. Repent of all known sin. We don't really like repentance. We don't like that word. We don't like the ideas that go with it. We think of things like making that list, thinking of everything you've ever done wrong. Who wants to do that? Repentance is not just making a list of all the stuff you've done wrong. More than that, what repentance is, is changing direction. Repentance actually in the Greek means to change your mind because of it, it really says to change your mind after after what after an encounter with god or after hearing about god or after reading in the bible about the truth of god something that makes you change your mind about where you're going and want to go in a different direction so repentance actually means to stop going this way and turn and go in a new direction and that's what happened to me that night I turned and I went in a different direction. Repent of all known sin. The second thing that Evan Roberts told those young people was let go. Let go of all doubtful habits. Repent of all known sin. Sin, the things that you know are sin. Repent of. But then there are other things that maybe you're not sure about. But you always have a little bit of a question in your mind. And sometimes we just have to ask the question of ourselves, you know, am I willing to let go of this if it would help someone else? Paul talks about not being a stumbling block to others. And so Evan Roberts said to these young people, let go of all doubtful habits. The third thing that he told them was to obey the Spirit quickly. Obey the Spirit quickly quickly how many how many times how many times has God called your name how many times has God called you into a deeper place how many times has God tried to draw you into a, an intimate place with him how many times have we ignored him how many times have we put him off how many times have we thought maybe later how many times have we thought it'd be a better time I can tell you guys, when I was young, when I was nine years old, we got a new preacher, and he came, and he preached the gospel, and it was the first time I'd ever heard it. And I was convinced, after hearing him preach for just a little bit, that being a Christian was the last thing I wanted. Because it sounded like a boring life. Really. I, I didn't want to be bored. I wanted to have fun. And it sounded to me like, you know, repenting of sin... And going with God was letting go of all the fun stuff and living kind of a boring life. And I was so dead wrong. Because walking with God, running with God, is the most absolutely incredible adventure that you could ever have. Repent of all known sin. Let go of doubtful habits. Not because God wants to steal from you, but because God wants to give to you. He says in, in John chapter 14, uh, the thief comes to steal, and to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10. And then in John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His heart for you is that you would have an adventurous 
exciting life that means something, that has purpose. Third thing he said was obey the Spirit quickly. We put him off, we put him off, and we put him off. He calls us to himself, and he continues to pursue, and continues to pursue. And then the fourth thing that he called them to do was to confess Jesus publicly. Confess Jesus publicly. You know, some interesting passages of Scripture in, uh, in the New Testament where Jesus says in a couple of the Gospels, uh, if you're ashamed of me and my words before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father. And then Paul says in Romans that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths, it will be safe. There's something about declaring our love for Jesus, declaring our commitment to Jesus, being willing to speak of our faith that is life-changing. Confessing Jesus publicly is one of the most powerful things that you can do. There was a man by the name of C.T. Studd. Now, C.T. Studd was a cricket player who became a missionary. Now, cricket is kind of a funny game. I don't know if you guys, any of you have ever played it. I've tried to play cricket a little bit in India. And it's kind of like baseball mixed together with croquet, uh, field hockey, just, you know, any, any number of games. But it's kind of a strange game. You run back and forth from one base, just kind of back and forth like this. And I don't know. But they love it over there. C.T. Studd was the greatest cricket player in all of England. And he met the Lord and was radically saved and felt the call to missions. And so he wanted to become a missionary. And he actually, his family was extremely wealthy. And he had inherited millions of dollars. And he gave every bit of it away, except for 50,000 pounds, which at that time was roughly $75,000. And he kept that part back only because he had read in the Bible that not taking care of your own family was worse than being an infidel. And so he didn't want to leave his own family without anything. So he took this 50,000 pounds and he took it to his wife and he gave it to her and said, here, I'm giving you this. I've given everything else away. And she said, you're not going to put that burden on me. And she gave away the 50,000 pounds. And they spent the rest of their days as missionaries. When they were engaged, they were serving as missionaries in China. And they were having a worship service. And it was towards the end of the service. And they wanted to sing a closing song. And the closing song was Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And as C.T. Studd began to uh, prepare to announce this closing song, he just felt like they needed to do something to emphasize the point of the song. And he looked around, and it was you know, kind of in a tabernacle like this, but they were all standing. They were already standing, and, and he, he said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to sing, stand up, and stand up for Jesus. But since we're already all standing, I want us to do something extra, so I want everybody here to stand up in your chair. So just climb up in your chair and stand in your chair. And standing in your chairs, we're going to sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus. And so that's what they did. Every person in the tabernacle stood in their chair and they sang the song. Every person except one man. And that one man was C.T. Studd's boss. He was the senior missionary of that mission. And he stood there with his arms crossed and sang the song but refused to get in his chair. And when the song was over, he came up to Mr. Studd. And he, he called him Charlie. And he said, Charlie, that was the most blatant display of emotionalism that I've ever seen. And if you ever do anything like that ever again, 
it'll be the last time you lead a service of worship anywhere in China. A few days went by, and a part, a part of their mission group was scheduled to take a trip to another part of China uh, to do some work, and uh, they were going on a big ship. And they boarded the ship, and they, were, they had set sail, and they were one day out on the deck, Charlie's fiance was sitting in a chair and this senior missionary saw her there and she, he walked over to her and he said, I'm really glad you're on this trip. I've been wanting to talk to you about something. She said, okay, great. And he said, I've noticed that you and Charlie seem to really enjoy God. And she said, yeah. We enjoy God. And he said, no, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm committed to God. I'm committed to God, and I'm committed to missions, and I'm committed to, to worship. But it seems to me that you and Charlie actually enjoy God, and you actually enjoy worship, and you actually enjoy missions. And she said, you know, you're right. We do. And she said, it hasn't always been that way. But there came a point in our lives where we knew that God was calling us to be all in. Where God was asking us to give ourselves completely over to him, to go wherever he said go, do whatever he said to do, and to be whoever he asked us to be. And when we absolutely, completely surrendered ourselves to him, he flooded us so deeply with his presence that, yeah, it changed everything for us. And we, we do. We enjoy God. We enjoy worship. We enjoy ministry. We just enjoy being alive. And the man looked at Charlie's fiance and he asked, he said, do you think God would do that for me. And she said, I, I'm, I'm sure that he would, but let me ask you, would you go anywhere he asked you to go? And he said, yes, I believe I would. And she said, well, would you be whoever he asked you to be? And he said, yes, I believe I would. She said, would you do whatever God wanted you to do? And he said, yes, yes, ma'am. I believe I would. And she said, I just got one more question. Would you stand in your chair for Jesus? And he said, yes, ma'am. I believe I would. She wrote in her journal, I stood up picked up my chair and I handed it to him. I said, here, you can have mine. And he took my chair. She said he turned and he walked into the saloon of the ship. She said, I don't know whether he went in there to preach or to pray. I just know that when he came out, he was a new man, never the same again. The question for us is not, have we gotten our ticket punched? It's not, you know, have your sins been forgiven? Are you going to go to heaven when you die? The question for us is, are we willing to go where he says to go? Are we willing to do what he says to do? Are we willing to be who he wants us to be? Because the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his because he didn't call us to survive he called us to overcome he called us to change the world he called us to follow him it's not about just believing it's about following 
going where he goes, doing what he does. This is what he wants for you. This is what he wants. He wants you to know what he knows, have what he has, and do what he did. He wants you to know what, what he knows. And what he knows is the absolute heart of the Father. He knows how his Father feels about him. When he was baptized and he came out of the water, the heavens opened. And the voice of God rang out like thunder and said, This is my son. I love him. He pleases me. There are men right here under this type of tabernacle who waited your whole life for your father to say that. Some of you waited your whole life for your dad to look at you and say, you're my boy, I love you, I'm proud of you. Some of us have heard it, some of us have not. But I want to say to you loud and clear that as important as it is to hear it from your biological dad, how much more to hear it from your Father in heaven. Jesus wants you to know that the declaration the Father made over him, the Father makes over you. When he looks at you tonight, he says, that's my boy. That is my boy. That's my son. I love him. He pleases me. He wants you to know what he knows. He wants you to have what he has. Scripture says that after he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the desert. And there he was tempted. And then he came out of the desert in the power of the Spirit. And he ministered for three years in the power of the Spirit. And then he said to his disciples, I'm leaving. And it's going to be better for you when I'm gone. And they said, you're crazy. You're the best thing we've ever known. How can it be better for us when you're gone? But you see, Jesus knew that Jesus with you is not as good as Jesus in you. And when he left, he said, when I'm gone, the promise of the Father will come. John baptized with water. But you're going to be baptized with fire by the Holy Spirit. God came to live in us. Jesus wants you to have what he has. The Spirit of God in him. The same Spirit. The Bible says the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is available to live in us. That's a big thing. He wants you to know what he knows. He wants you to have what he has. Why? Because he wants you to do what he did. My favorite quote, I, I love quotes. I, I write down quotes all the time. When I hear good quotes, I just can't wait to get my hands on them. I love quotes. My favorite quote was got by a guy out in California in Sacramento who pastors a church out there. And it goes like this. The difference between people who do stuff and people who don't do stuff is that people who do stuff, do stuff. Makes sense, doesn't it? The difference between people who do stuff and don't do stuff is that people who do stuff, do stuff. Listen, God didn't save you for you. He saved you for everybody else. He saved you, not just for you, but for all of those that don't know him. He wants you to do what he did. What did he do? Everywhere he went, he preached the kingdom. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. Cast out demons. Cast out demons. I was in Brazil with a group of students from the University of Jordan. Missionary said, tomorrow Tom's going to preach. I'm going to translate we're going to give an invitation and people are going to come and you're going to pray for them. And here's how you know 
here's how you'll know what to pray because they speak Portuguese and you speak English. And so we'll do four lines. And whatever line they go through, that's what they want for prayer. You'll, you'll know by what line they go through, how to pray for them. And line number one is for salvation. And line number two is for being filled with the Holy Spirit. And line number three is for physical healing. And line number four is for deliverance if they have demons. If they come to line number four, you cast the demons out of them. And I'm with college students. They're 19, 20 years old. And he said, just go to whatever line you feel comfortable ministering in. And so the next day I preach, everything happens the way he says it was. I preach, we give the invitation, hundreds of people come for prayer. I call for the students to come up to pray, and every one of them runs to the salvation line. There's nobody to pray for anybody else, and I'm literally pushing them down the line. And I wind up myself and, and one, other, one student at the end of the line praying for people to be delivered from demons. And, and you know what we saw that day? We saw people delivered from demons. We saw demons cast out. We saw people healed. We saw people filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw people give their lives to Jesus. That's what Jesus did. Read it. It's in the book. Everywhere he went, preaching the kingdom, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. That's what he wants us to do. And he's given you his spirit. So you can do it. He wants you to know what he wants, have what he has, so you can do what he did. His call for you. Go out beyond the rope. Don't stand around with water up to your waist, the floaties on your arms, looking out over that rope and wondering, what would it be like just one time? to get in over my head. Just go for it. You and I were made for the deep end of the pool. And it's the only place we'll ever be satisfied. Now let's pray. Lord, I pray for these men here tonight. If there's anyone here tonight who's unsure, they don't really know if I've ever really said yes to Jesus, I pray that they, they wouldn't put it off. That they would obey the Spirit quickly. So they hear the voice of God saying, come to me. That they would do that tonight. If there are some who are, who are here tonight who would say, you know, I, I've just kind of dabbled along. And I've settled. I've settled for less than God has offered. And, and tonight, I want to take a step. I want to get in the deep end of the pool. I, I want to go for it. I don't want to settle anymore. If that's any man here tonight, Lord, I pray you give them the courage to step forward and to be prayed for tonight. If there's some here tonight who simply want to say, I, I just want to... Surrender. I want to just say, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be who you want me to be. If that's some of the men here tonight, I pray, give them the courage to say yes to that. Lord, I pray. I pray that we would lean into you tonight, that we would not lean away, that we would not resist, that we would allow you to have your way in us. Do what you want to do in us so you can do what you want to do through us. In Jesus' name, amen.